Our next speaker is uh, Scott Yates, November 4, Bravo, Bravo, Bravo. He is a uh, member of the Murray County Amateur Radio Club, the license of 78. Uh, he's a member of the Navy Mars, uh, let's see, for 36 years. Uh, he's an active member of Shares right now. He's a retired network uh, consultant. <laughs> And he is going to talk about to us about the world's largest cannery antenna at Jim Creek Naval Air Station in Arlington, Washington. Scott, are you there? Good afternoon. Good morning to everybody there. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, the purpose of this is to let you know about something I did. It was about 13 years ago, and uh, it was a, a very, very exciting opportunity. Um, I was doing... Um, site surveys uh, working on a large worldwide wireless network and um, part of what i had to do is I had to check out this this naval radio station in arlington washington and which is you know more than i expected um and so i didn't know what to expect i expected it's going to be a radio station well this radio station you can see from earth orbit um, it is a great place. It's maintained as a recreational center for Navy personnel. They can go there, rent cabins, take a, uh, uh, take a uh, RV, something like that. And they do maintain these type places uh, for, their, uh, uh, for their military members. And so that's what this is. But what it is in reality is it's the largest VLF radio transmitters in existence when it was built in 1953. So I was there doing a, during a scheduled maintenance uh, period and looking for an electrical metering system to be carried by a Wi-Fi radio mesh network. I did not expect to see what I saw. Um, one of the primary engineers was there. This was a maintenance period. They took, were down for three days. And he took great pride showing me around who could actually appreciate the station. Uh, of course, I couldn't take pictures, but, you know, I've got old pictures that they produced. So there is where it is. I was working heavily in the Pacific Northwest uh, for the DOD and uh, for the Navy specifically. And it's out in the country outside of Arlington, Washington. And, you know, you just... Uh, it, it's an interesting place to get to um, once, once you get there. By the way, part of that area south of the, uh, um, uh, of the Seattle-Tacoma area is an actual uh, mid-latitude rainforest. So that, that it rains a lot up there. So that's where they located radio station in LK. And the purpose of radio station in LK, and there it is from Earth orbit, and it is huge. It is, it is gigantic. You can't miss it. If you look it up on Google Earth or something like that, you cannot miss this place. And it's this big circle. So what does it do? It does something special. It allows them to, trash, to transmit radio signals to submerged submarines around the world. Um, you can see this overview picture right here. You see the transmitter site down there on the, on the bottom. There's the transmitter house. And you see these towers right here. Those are the feed points. That's how they get the signal to the radiators. And you actually see one center glass insulator up here. And um, th that, that tells you a lot about this, this entire antenna system. Um, the support towers go from this mountain range to the mountain range back here. And there are steel cables. You can see a little bit of the cable there if you look. There are steel cables going between the two mountain tops. And, um, you know, I thought that was interesting. Also, the valley floor underneath these antenna systems are covered with 12 gauge bare copper wire held together with split nuts. And it, sometimes they're right on the ground. In other cases, they're about a foot above the ground. But, you know, so there's, there's your classic counterpoise. So next slide is 
and there's the system and that's i forgive that sort of grungy video there that grungy uh, uh scene but if you look at the uh system that's what they call a catenary antenna system so the cables go from peak to peak to peak across the valley floor and they serve a, a, a secondary purpose which is very very interesting so here we go the antenna matching systems everything you've ever seen in a trans match or a, or a linear amplifier multiply by a hundred and these the, the transmitter house here uh, well this is actually the antenna feed points look at all those circles up there they are just packed with corona discharge uh circles um, uh, the, the idea is they're up there in the cloudy damp mountains of washington state and corona discharge could do some huge damage particularly when they're running at 1.2 megawatts also if you look at this monster matching system over here look at the size of these coils in the actual transmitter room and each each room they have two of them there are three water-cooled triodes they're very special units i'll get to that in just a second but anyway, those walls there, there are solid copper plates all soldered, to, soldered together. Here we go. And there's this place they call the Helix House. And there you see more Corona Discharge uh, donuts. And these are bundles of bundles of bundles of Litz wire. You know, very thin wire, you know, a couple times the size of a human hair. And you have to have huge amounts of inductance to tune the vertical antennas to the frequencies they're using at 24.9 kilohertz. And lots of times at night, you can hook up an SDR and you can hear 24.9 kilohertz. I'm not saying it's necessarily Jim Creek, but you can certainly hear something. But if you look at that, they're actually coupling motors in there and they can servo turn the internal core slightly to change the coupling. So in 1953, when it was built, they built this monster radio station just for the purpose of talking to submarines. Uh, it, it also has other, other purposes, but... Um, the, the situation is, is when you're talking at 24.9 kilohertz, as I says here in that first bullet point, a half wavelength is 19,830 feet. Now, for anybody who's used a vertical on 80 meters, we know that's a challenge. Imagine doing it at 24.9 kilohertz. Now, they state in their documentation that the transmitter is located in the middle of a dipole arrangement. It's not what we call normal dipoles. To them, at those days, they had a north side and a south side, and they could use both of them or, or turn one off for maintenance and then use the other. So that's what they're meaning here. Um, the interesting thing is, is when I went there, I was with a bunch of double E's, and they were mainly looking at electrical concerns. And of course, I was the ham radio operator and I was walking around with my mouth ag aghast at what all I was seeing. And I told them, I figured that what this is gonna be, it's gonna be in-fed monopoles. And you, know, you couldn't see anything because the clouds were in and you just couldn't see the antennas. Fortunately, before we left, the clouds cleared and sure enough, it was, it was giant. 10 foot long glass insulators, 500 feet above the ground, feeding a, uh, a vertical element that fed that ground, that, that feed bus. There's a picture of some of the feed lines and you'll notice in that it's even got the Corona discharge donuts. Um, it's apparently, you know, I can't imagine what it's like to run 1.2 megawatts, particularly at 25 KC. But at the same time, you know, there must be gigantic voltages and currents in those antennas. So it must be, it must be a, a, a big challenge, but they dealt with it. Now, the uh, idea is that that 
radio station can send any signal to any location, any place of the seven seas. And the data rate was lifted at 50 baud. And for any of you all who have ever tried to resurrect an old Model 15 teletype, that's not very far from what I think most of those started at 45 uh, baud. Um, those old teletype systems were, were exactly what they used to send flash traffic. Now, the uh, megawatt transmitter was designed around some special tubes, some RCA 5831s, which are rated at 500 kW. Uh, it's a high vacuum triode. Uh, each of the two power amplifiers employs three of those, two of which are used, the third of which is a spare that can be switched in. Uh, these tubes were in water, in water enclosures. So there was always being water cooled. Also too, and remember this is 1953, they had microsecond fault protection. They didn't want to be blowing up those tubes. I'm sure they're not cheap. They're probably more than most people would spend for a house today for one of those tubes. I've any of you all tried getting tubes for your uh, amplifiers and stuff. Uh, unless you can find a Svetlana, they're not very good anymore. Uh, but um, th they had microsecond fault protection. And that was specially developed for this radio station. And it, it, it helps preserve this, the hardware in the event of an emergency. The tuning adjustments, and I'm sure they, they had to fine tune them all the time, depending on the atmospheric humidity and other things, and ground conductivity as well. They had push button controls of the servo motors that varied the coupling in those big, in the helix house. So they would tune it and they would get the best reflected power, lowest reflected power, and they'd go from there. Um, the stuff, a lot of this stuff was very proprietary, very new stuff that RCA had developed for them. Um, the transmitter itself was contained in a big enclosure. If you've ever seen a big continental broadcast transmitter or TV transmitter, kind of like that. And it was in a U shape with the control panel in the middle. Um, the entire building is shielded against the intense electromagnetic field. Uh, the structure always incl includes their own machine, electrical, sheet metal, and other servicing shops so they could keep that thing on the air. It was a mission critical uh, system. And there's an actual Navy release. Let's see, Washington, November 18th. So this is probably 1953. You can see part of the feed lines right here and right here. And so they go up to the feed points, those, those red um, towers you saw, and go up to the vertical radiating elements. And um, it, was, it was an amazing thing. I think it says here to, in this newspaper article that it was a $14 million installation. Now that was 1953. Can you think of what this would be today? It, it would it'd be probably stratospheric. And so there's the layout of the transmitters and the control panel. And it even had its, its own little uh, military service number. So the antennas, um, uh, the catenary antenna system was called a valley span antenna. And the main purpose of that, besides supporting the vertical elements, the radiating elements, is all that steel wire overhead provided a great capacitive hat. And anybody who's ever worked on a shortened vertical for 160 or 80 understands the value that that capacitive hat can produce. Uh, that, that will give you considerable increase in uh, efficiency and ease of, re of resonance compared to one without it. So they, um, they, they actually use the structure itself as part of its uh, radiating system. And there we talk about the same thing that I just talked about. So I won't bore you with that. Um, the, the thing that surprised me 
because we all know that if you put up a, a vertical antenna, you put some radials underneath it. And here they had a radial base that was probably a mile and a half by a mile and a half. So that's what I call a big counterpoise. But as I, as I got there, it was all cloud covered. Couldn't see a thing. Just stuff disappeared up into the clouds. And I had to speculate what I thought was going to be up there. Um, I was the only ham there. So I was the only one really fascinated with that part of it. And as we were getting ready to leave and the entire valley cleared of clouds all at once. And there it was 500 feet above me, a big glass insulator and, and the vertical wires, the radiated wires and all that type stuff. And it was just, it was just amazing to see. And it's one of those things you just never get to see at, uh, at any other time. So in summary, and I'm sure you appreciate my, uh, my brevity in this, you know, sometimes, particularly in jobs like mine, sometimes you get to go places and see things you never expected to see. And you might just be in the right place at the right time to see something you'll never forget. So I hope you all get to see something like that as well. Um, one quick comment on listening to y'all talking about TEMA and ARES and all the organizations. The thing to keep in mind that, that is so impressive to me is that in these organizations, almost all the people are volunteers and they're doing it for the good of their communities and they are, they are there just to be of help. And back when I was EC in Rutherford County, I always said, if you, if you declare an emergency, the ham radio operators are still going to beat a path to your door and they'll be quick to help. And that's something that says an awful lot about ARES, whatever county, whatever state they're in, is we're there to help. Anyway, that is all for me. Thank you all for listening and attending. And I was, I was very honored to be included in your uh, order of meeting today. This, uh, so uh, back over to you and I'll turn off my screen share.